An emotional message tonight from WA's top traffic cop to Perth's young drivers and their parents. A wealthy Floriac couple accused of starving their teenage daughter. Senator Lydia Thorpe's screaming spray at the King in Canberra. Payday for sacked Qantas staff, landing a huge compensation victory. Would you like fries with that? Donald Trump's drive through debut. And global tennis superstars on their way to Perth for the United Cup. This is Nine News Perth with Michael Thompson. Good evening. You're about to hear a heartfelt plea from our top traffic cop. He's speaking to Perth's young drivers and their parents after a deadly weekend on our roads. In fact, our deadliest day this year. Six people killed, families tonight reeling. The government promising again to do more. This morning, Indian Ocean Drive, emergency crews at another crash. Three cars, seven people, one woman flown to hospital. A relief to learn no one was seriously hurt after the worst 24 hours on WA roads this weekend. Until you uh, experience that guttural cry and desperation from a parent, uh, which stays with you for a long time, then until you've experienced that, you don't really appreciate what it's like. Mike Bell is WA's traffic boss. It's Commander Bell and his team who deliver the worst news to so many families. It's not just the family, it's the friends, it's the community, it's the sporting clubs, it's the workplaces. 34-year-old Blaine Clinch, a father of four, and 22-year-olds Jaden Requata Wood and George Decani, three young men killed in that Carlisle crash. This afternoon, George's mother visiting the scene with her own message. Hopefully our young ones are out there um, listening and taking this very seriously. Do the right thing even when no one's watching. Two other young men, their mates, tonight fighting for life in hospital. On Saturday afternoon, Indonesian national Finna Febrianti, one of two young women killed in Gilderton, today remembered by her partner. She's lovely, Sarah. She's lovely, real lovely. On her birthday, on the February 16th, on next year, I really want to propose to her. Her 31-year-old friend, Rosanti Dwee, also killed on Indian Ocean Drive. WA police desperate for drivers, particularly young men, to think when they're behind the wheel. Think about your parents when I go around and knock on their door and give them that bad news that you aren't coming home, that you're in the morgue somewhere. You know, think of the, the impact that's going to have on your parents for the rest of their lives and your sisters and siblings and brothers and families. It's not something that goes away. For Daniel Campo, who lost his son Nick in a car crash in July, the weekend fatalities sparked a call to Commander Bell Saturday night. How distressed he was 14 weeks after the passing of his son and still the ramifications that that's having for him and his families. Men are disproportionately involved in fatal car crashes, with 81% of those killed being male. Despite road safety campaigns, the message doesn't seem to be getting through. Police now calling for parents to step in and have crucial conversations with their children. Have those conversations and just don't have one, have regular conversations about slowing down, taking it easy, you know, sticking to the road rules. After September's road safety round table, the government continues to search for ways to bring down the road toll, which now sits at 148 lives lost this year. Oh, we'll look at stepping up and again uh, increasing the shock um, in sort of advertising. Sarah Smith, Nine News. It's a claim that's distressing to hear a wealthy couple accused of starving their teenage daughter. Today they went on trial as prosecutors revealed it was persistent dance instructors who raised the alarm, saving the girl from further suffering. What these Floriant parents are accused of is unimaginable, allegedly starving their daughter, putting her at risk of death. Prosecutors say the girl's dance teachers first raised the alarm in 2019 confronting the couple who homeschooled their child. 
but the pair claimed she ate a healthy vegan diet and her orange and sallow skin was due to eating too many carrots. Concerns were also raised about the girl's behaviour, watching shows like Bluey and Thomas the Tank Engine. In June 2020, authorities became involved, threatening further action if the girl wasn't taken to see a doctor. That did happen. A jury today heard that a medical professional had never encountered a child with such low BMI. The teen then wound up at hospital, spending 50 days under the care of professionals, putting on seven kilograms and growing three centimetres. Just five weeks before she was admitted, she weighed just 23 kilograms. The defence says the teenager wasn't denied food and medical tests didn't reveal any serious problems. They described the girl as a fussy eater. Bianca Carboni, Nine News. King Charles and Queen Camilla have been welcomed to Canberra today, but their visit to the capital wasn't all smooth sailing. Controversial Senator Lydia Thorpe unleashing a tirade directed at King Charles during a reception at Parliament House before she was forcibly removed. Charles Croucher begins our coverage. A message for King on country. Give us our land back. Give us what you stole from us. You destroyed our land. Give us Victoria Senator Lydia Thorpe in a traditional cloak with a very non-traditional welcome. For 45 seconds, she berated the king and crown, accusing the monarchy of genocide, all while being ushered out of Parliament's Great Hall. The colony. Senator Thorpe had turned her back on the anthem and started the day with a run-in with police, leaving her without a shirt. A far from silent minority outside the War Memorial, the first stop for the King and Queen. Inside, they were greeted by a lone bugler... ..and a wall lined with the lost and with poppies. The King and Queen adding two more. The Sovereign, solemn. This well-known visitor bowing before our unknown soldier. Back outside, reward for those that had waited so long. It was amazing. It was Absolutely just, oh, incredible. It we was incredible. It. I didn't get to shake the king's hand, but I got to shake Queen Camilla's hand. It was so good. It's a wonderful experience just to see the crowd and so many happy people. From the people to the pageantry. 21 gun salute, dozens of military members, hundreds waiting inside. Miners, medalists, monarchists and MPs. People have had haircuts, people have shined shoes, suits have been pressed, and that's just the Republicans. Like the Prime Minister. And on behalf of all Australians, we wish you an absolutely splendid stay. Throughout my life, Australia's First Nations peoples have done me the great honour of sharing so generously their stories and cultures. Including today. <laughs> Senator Thorpe removed and a chuckle from Prime Minister and King. Next month marks 25 years since Australia had the chance to walk away from the monarchy, but we didn't. Now a next vote seems generations away as the anthem proclaims this king long to reign over us. It means Australian kids won't get the chance to be head of state. I love your glasses. <laughs> but they can at least look the part. If he comes and says hello, what do you think you'll say to him? Um, where's your um, crown? Where's your crown? Yeah. He's left it at home, hasn't he? Yeah. Do you think you could maybe borrow yours? <laughs> maybe. Charles Croucher, Nine News. And the King received a spray of the humorous kind earlier as he met with crowds outside the Australian War Memorial. As Kate Creedon explains, among them Hefner, the sneezing alpaca. A convoy fit for a King and Queen. Camilla in the front seat, 13 vehicles in all. The Royal Motorcade speeding into Yarralumba. 
And there the King, telling opposition leader Peter Dutton, the Governor-General's residence, reminded him of his late grandmother's home in England. The King then recounting his earlier face-to-face -face at the War Memorial with Hefner, the alpaca, who came dressed for the occasion. It's seized on me. I've got the I was in the pool years ago, an elephant sneezed on me. That's not a good idea. <laughs> in another room, the Queen was meeting with senior figures leading Australia's battle with domestic violence, including former Australian of the Year, Rosie Batty. All Australian governments have now signed up to a national plan uh, with a very ambitious target to end violence against women. Outside, the royals reunited, the Queen planting a tree to mark their visit, the King parting with advice for some school kids. And good luck with all your dreaded exams and things. You can always blame us if, we, if, you, do, if you fail. <laughs> At the CSIRO's Rose Bushfire Research Lab, the King was shown a pyrotron, a wind tunnel that simulates a bushfire, helping researchers understand the impact on our bushland. This is an opportunity for the King to show his long interest in conservation and the climate while raising awareness for a cause close to his heart. Outside, an ACT fire crew climbed into their truck to demonstrate the burnover protection system, the King merely disappearing in the shower that covered the truck. Your Majesty, what did you think of that? It's very encouraging, isn't it? See what can be done. The Queen had diverted to the Botanic Gardens to meet organisers of the charity Give It, of which she is a patron, an organisation that supports those impacted by disasters. Well, I congratulate you all on everything you do. You're doing a brilliant job. In Canberra, Kate Creedon, Nine News. And Kate joins us now from Canberra, Kate, where it's been a huge day for their majesties. It was jam-packed, Tomo. The King and Queen covered so much ground here in Canberra. They spent the afternoon at the Botanic Gardens, uh, where they were, uh, which has the largest collection of Australian uh, plants in the world. They were learning a little bit more about our native flora there, and particularly the impact of climate change. To commemorate their visit, they also uh, planted a tree assisted by 92-year-old volunteer Doreen Wilson. Now, after that, they headed off to the airport. They've boarded a plane back to Sydney where hopefully they will get some much needed rest because it is going to be another huge day tomorrow. Tomo? It is a busy tour. Kate, thank you. And we'll have special extended coverage of the King and Queen's events in Sydney tomorrow from 10.45am on Today Extra and on Nine News and Nine Now. Three former Qantas workers sacked during the pandemic have had a big win in the federal court. A judge ruling they are entitled to compensation, a decision that will pave the way for payments to almost 2,000 other ex-employees. The party started and they hadn't even left the building. Woo! What a win! This is finally the day for justice for 1,700 workers who did nothing wrong. The federal court today ruling on a compensation payout for the sacked workers based on three case studies. What a victory against almost like our mother and father was the family working for Qantas. It was family. I loved working at Qantas. I expected to be there till I retired. And when this happened, it was an absolute shock. The flying kangaroo ordered to pay a total of $170,000 in compensation to the three former workers. But this win is a test flight of sorts for 1,700 dismissed staff waiting in the wings. This was a decision about three test cases. It now has to be applied to every other illegally sacked worker to determine the global figure that Qantas has to pay. This is probably worth in excess of $100 million, this, this global compensation figure. And it could get even worse for Qantas. That figure will likely soar past $100 million if the company is hit with penalties as well. In a statement, Qantas said it apologises to former ground handling employees. The federal court found that while there were valid and lawful commercial reasons for the outsourcing, it could not rule out that Qantas also had an unlawful reason. Today's decision ending the four-year David and Goliath battle, another blow to an already hurting kangaroo. Alex Anki, Nine News.
The foster mother of missing boy William Turrell claims police have done nothing to figure out what happened to him for years. Detectives have named the woman who cannot be identified as a person of interest and allege she disposed of the then three-year-old's body. She's released a statement to news.com.au saying she loved William fiercely and claimed police were persecuting her. Donald Trump has pulled off a major campaign stunt, tying on an apron and serving up fries at McDonald's, the Republican candidate trying to win over support in a crucial state. Drive through Donald. I like this job. I think I might come back and do it again. Eh? A highly orchestrated campaign stunt at McDonald's, complete with his own supporters. And you know this is compliments of Trump, OK? Yes, thank okay. you. Here's your present. Yes. Please don't let the United States become Brazil, my native Brazil. Oh, uh, well, we'll Please. keep it good. The Republican candidate dining out on the attention and loving it. So much. Thank so you nice. for taking the bullet. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. much. Yeah, I took a bullet. That's right. As he tries to win over support in Pennsylvania, the state that could decide the election race. I love salt. Wait a minute, I spilled some. <laughs> I'm very superstitious. Making this stop after repeatedly attacking Kamala Harris's past work at the fast food chain. Look at the crowd over there. Look how happy everybody is. They're happy because they want hope. They... Delivering her message of hope in church, the vice president on her 60th birthday. It is not enough to preach the values of compassion and respect. We must live them. Given a gift of song by Stevie Wonder. <laughs> And from her opponent... I want to wish her a happy 60th birthday, right? As Kamala Harris sent a warning far beyond the largely black American congregations in Georgia. Our country is at a crossroads. And where we go from here is up to us. With this election so tight, church leaders are calling on black American men to give her a surge in support. Whenever you need something, the Bible says there arose a mother. But I'd say that rose a woman of God. In 15 days, Americans will decide if she rises to the highest office in the land. In the United States, Jonathan Kersley, Nine News. Rainy skies cleared to sunshine today. Natalia Cooper, are we done with the showers? Not quite yet. There is the slight chance of one tomorrow, Tomo. We've now had 47.4 millimetres so far this October, when we normally get 39.3 over the whole month. There were some decent falls in the 24 hours to nine this morning. Bickley picked up 15 millimetres, 13 fell at Jandicott. Whiteman Park had 11 millimetres in their gauge, while the city recorded around five. Our night was pretty chilly, dipping to 9.8 degrees. We then climbed to a top of 19.7 around a quarter to two this afternoon. After tomorrow it's nothing but sunshine and it's warming up to your full forecast a little later Tomo. Sunshine sounds good. Natalia, thank you. The major rebuild of a northern suburbs primary school next. Better facilities for hundreds of Perth students. Blasts felt across Beirut as hundreds of residents flee their homes. Flood emergency in Italy, hundreds saved as water fills homes and streets. And the fight to keep kids safe from a dog terrorising a neighbourhood. A $22 million rebuild of Hillary's primary school is now complete. First opened in 1973. The refurbished facility now has 19 new classrooms. The Education Minister revealing half of all WA schools are at least 50 years old, needing similar upgrades. There's a considerable amount and we have uh, we've engaged in a major project. We've built about 31 primary schools since 2017. The upgrade had been delayed due to supply chain constraints and soil contamination. Israeli forces have unleashed a nighttime bombardment on Beirut's southern suburbs shortly after issuing a warning for residents to evacuate. The IDF claiming to be targeting Hezbollah's financial institutions. Enormous blasts in Lebanon's capital. Israeli airstrikes raining down on parts of Beirut. The nighttime blitz coming with a warning for residents to evacuate. We'll be targeting a large number of sites in the coming hours, an IDF spokesman says. The targets here, according to Israeli forces, Hezbollah's finance network. Israel promising to reveal how Hezbollah uses civil institutions as a cover. 
The operation followed the convening of Israel's Security Council by Benjamin Netanyahu and comes a day after his home was targeted by a drone. Footage released too of Hezbollah targets being struck in southern Lebanon and vast tunnel networks near the Israeli border being blown apart. Despite the onslaught, Hezbollah still troubles Israel's defences. Around 170 rockets fired, some starting fires in the north. In central Gaza, <laughs> chaos and grief after another deadly blast. Wounded are carried from a truck and rushed into Al-Aqsa hospital. The Israeli strike on a car in Deir al-Bala, killing at least six. The number of dead from the strike in northern Gaza the previous night rising to at least 87, according to health officials. A figure Israeli forces don't agree with. What is known is heavy fire inside the Strip continues, despite the elimination of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. In London, Edward Godfrey, Nine News. A boy has been killed in floods sweeping parts of Italy with Bologna and surrounding areas in the country's north hit with torrential rain. Firefighters have carried out more than 300 rescue operations and dozens of people have been evacuated. And vigils have been held around the world for former One Direction singer Liam Payne, who fell to his death from a hotel balcony in Argentina last week. Flowers and messages were piled high in London's Hyde Park, with similar scenes in Paris and in Madrid. An Australian council has been forced to act on a dangerous dog terrorising a neighbourhood in Brisbane, killing family pets and mauling animals. Residents fear it's only a matter of time before it attacks a human. You can't read his tag, but the distinctive red and yellow collar says everything. This dog is dangerous. So we're just living in fear constantly. The Staffordshire Bull Terrier is responsible for killing two beloved family pets and attacking other animals in Sherwood. Jessie's cat Ari was mauled to death in her driveway in April in front of her young son. And the dog just grabbed him by the throat and started tearing him to shreds. Just months earlier, this same dog killed Amanda Tuppock's cat Penelope. I had to hold on to the dog, call counsel, but eventually the owners showed up and collected the dog. The owner denies her dog was responsible. Brisbane City Council declared the dog dangerous in May. It means he must wear a council-issued collar and cannot leave his home without wearing a muzzle. He must be kept in an approved enclosure, unable to escape. But residents claim the staffy keeps escaping and is out in public without its muzzle. Isn't he supposed to have a muzzle on? His owner captured on CCTV searching for him in locals' backyards. Julian! She's already been fined by council five times for letting her dog wander. Can I ask why you're not securing your dog properly? What is it going to take before it goes for a child? Council has now seized the dog and following our investigation, today issued an order for the dog to be euthanised for community safety. The pet owner can still appeal the decision, but council says it's unlikely the dog will be released back home again. Emily Prain, Nine News. Your private details traded for profit. Still to come this hour, how a scientist deep dive into the little known world of data brokers led to a shock find. How to stop the scammers. Stay with us. That report is ahead. Australian led paralysis breakthrough. Next scientist on the brink of a world first cure. The new trial helping people to walk again. A bold interest rate prediction from the ANZ boss. Drink up while we're set for a tap water overhaul. And a nod to the 90s as Fashion Week kicks off. Nine News, brought to you by Hyundai. Have you tried it? Now you can. Australians may have to wait longer for the Reserve Bank to cut interest rates, according to ANZ's CEO. And those concerns are seeing record high numbers enrol into financial literacy programs to learn skills that could help. Financial stress is at decade highs, and while most economists expect interest rate cuts will bring relief by February, the CEO of ANZ is worried that won't happen. That's what I worry about, you know, that people are taking it for granted that cuts are going to be early, uh, and I, I worry that they may be a little bit um, further away. A reality check most won't want to hear in the lead-up to Christmas. I worry 
that inflation's a little bit more set in than we may like. The Reserve Bank will weigh that up at its next meeting on November 5, but Australians are already taking matters into their own hands. The country's biggest financial literacy program, Saver Plus, has this year seen a 42% spike in participation. Mum of four, Cara Rogers, telling others today who are financially stressed to jump in. I swear by it. I tell my family about it. I tell all my friends about it. The program runs online for 10 hours across 10 months, covering budgeting, managing debts and financial planning. It's open to students over the age of 18 or those with a child in school and they must receive some government payment. Any savings made during the program will be matched by ANZ up to $500. Young people in particular are piling into the course. Sign-ups for 18 to 25-year-olds, in fact, are four times higher now than they were this time last year. One of the reasons why we're seeing a growth in demand is because often people are leaving school, school without um, this uh, capability, this confidence. And in the absence of relief, that demand is expected to keep rising. Programs like this are really well-timed to be effective when times are tough. Chris Kohler, Nine News. Stamp duty is a horrible tax that stops Australians getting into a home. That's what the Business Council of Australia reckons as it releases a landmark report into fixing the housing supply crisis. The council makes 29 recommendations, including setting up a fund to incentivise states to phase out the tax. We think it's important to have a fund like the National Reform Fund, which helps states cover those, at least initially, particularly difficult years as you undertake this type of transition. The report also calls for consistent zoning rules, faster approval processes and training more skilled workers to help build new homes. Australian scientists could be on the verge of curing paralysis as plans are announced for world-first human clinical trials. It's hoped a treatment using nerve cells taken from the nose could help repair spinal cord injuries. This time two years ago, Joe Ponyu was a rugby league prodigy, signed to the Gold Coast Titans at 16 and on the verge of a promising career until a catastrophic on-field injury changed everything. I was playing a trial match against the Brisbane Broncos and um, I collided with a goalpost trying to make a tackle. Joe left a C3 quadriplegic, one of 20,000 Australians living with spinal cord injury, given hope today by the announcement of world-first human clinical trials getting underway in the new year. Griffith University scientists aiming to repair damage to the spinal cord and regain function and feeling. We're aiming low, hoping for high. If a person can move a finger again, that means they can pick up a fork and feed themselves. Their treatment using highly regenerative sense of smell cells harvested from the patient's own nose. It's the only part of the nervous system that regenerates every day as part of its normal function. And prepared into what's called a nerve bridge. The specialised nerve bridge takes just 24 hours to form into what you see here. It's then transplanted into the injury site within the spinal cord in a delicate operation. Repairing the spinal cord is now a real possibility. The movement of one arm or one leg or what it, like a little bit of sensation all those things are huge. Regained function won't come overnight though requiring intensive long-term rehabilitation on top of the transplant. But it might take a year or two years before they get improvements. 30 volunteers will be needed for the trial. Those interested can contact Griffith University before expressions of interest go live. Claire Todd Hunter, Nine News. Standards for tap water in Australia could be about to change. New guidelines to limit cancer-linked substances known as forever chemicals have been released by the National Health and Medical Research Council. Under the changes, three different kinds of chemicals in our drinking water would be dramatically slashed. We can expect the bright, the bold and a few nods to the 90s as Melbourne Fashion Week takes centre stage. There's a packed schedule of runways and exhibits as the event celebrates its 30th year. In a laneway between city office buildings, this is the stylish start to a week dedicated to the fashion forward. It's 
bold, bright and fittingly includes nods to the 90s as Melbourne Fashion Week celebrates 30 years of putting local talent in the spotlight. This is the, the bones and roots of fashion in Melbourne. It really is the beginning for so many uh, designers. And the launch pad has come a long way from posing on a public tram to taking over some of the city's most recognisable spots. There's also a new focus on sustainable and repurposed fashion as many look for a wardrobe refresh without spending a fortune. You can attend and get a lot of inspiration. Be reminded that you have that jacket at home but I can buy that dress and that dress can be worn season after season. Whether you're a consumer or whether you're a creative um, and whether you're a designer or whether you're a textile artist or whether you're a photographer, whatever that creative process is, I think this is a way to be involved in all of it. Stephanie Anderson, Nine News. Keeping your private details safe, that is after sport. We uncover the ways your personal information is being traded for profit. And the survey finding our kids are more engaged if they don't have access to a mobile phone. But first, Matthew Pavlich is here with Sport and Pav. We have some top-tier talent coming our way. Yeah, we sure do, Tomo. Some of the world's best will land here in Perth after the unveiling of the United Cup teams. The West is blessed, a host of stars serving up the start of summer. Vacant Nest, another delisted defender, departs West Coast. And opening up, the Aussie top spot still very much up for grabs. Top 10 Americans Coco Goff and Taylor Fritz are among a host of stars set to feature in Perth for the United Cup. The official draw unveiling the US will be joined in the West by defending champions Germany and Stefanos Tsitsipas' Greece, while our homegrown talent is Sydney bound. A roll call of tennis superstars. Coco Goff, Taylor Fritz, uh, Stefanos Tsitsipas, Maria Sakkari, Alexander Zverev, Rabakina, as I mentioned. I mean, you really will be looking forward to watching the creme de la creme here in Perth. Just a few of the heavy hitters heading to WA for December's United Cup. Perth hosting some of the game's biggest stars, with reigning champions Germany returning, along with China, Greece and top-seeded USA. It's really a top-end group of teams, I think, that are going to compete here. There'll be some blockbusters, I think, every day. But while the event still promises top-tier tennis and similar theatrics to last year's edition... <laughs> ..West Aussies won't get to see our local talent in the flesh. Alex Dimonor and Isla Tomljanovic off to Sydney. So too the likes of Iga Sviontek's Poland and Jasmine Paolini's Italy. Australia again finding themselves in the same group as Great Britain. We played against uh, them last year in Perth as well. Uh, it's a tough one, obviously. Uh, Alex's girlfriend, Katie Bolt, is in the team as well. The Demon still dealing with the hip injury that ended his Wimbledon campaign and caused him to miss the Olympics. He's had really a breakout year, really cementing himself in the top ten in the world as well. So it's frustrating that he hasn't been able to get those match practice, I guess, under his belt leading into the end of the year, but that's certainly what he's trying to do over the next month. The full schedule and tickets for the United Cup will go on sale tomorrow. Erin Harwood, Nine News. Josh Rotham's time at West Coast has come to an end after 72 games. The 26-year-old taken to social media to thank the club after learning he wouldn't be offered a contract for next season. Rotham joins Alex Witherden, Jai Cully and Kobe Bergeau in being axed, following a lengthy wait while the Eagles appointed their new coach. In years gone by, you used to either get told you were, you were staying on or delisted in your exit meeting, so we sort of had to wait around for seven weeks with no communication because because the club had no update, so we were just sort of sitting, twiddling our thumbs. Meanwhile, Fremantle's pre-season campaign is set to begin against an Indigenous All-Stars team at Optus Stadium in February, with a possibility that Captain Alex Pearce, veteran Michael Walters and gun recruit Shay Bolton may play against their teammates. Well, Cameron Bancroft's hopes of a test recall have taken another hit. The opener again failing to fire for WA in the Sheffield Shield. The 31-year-old yet to reach double figures so far this season as he hopes to impress Australian selectors. But he's not alone. His rival's also battling with the bat. Cameron Bancroft's chances of a West Test recall appear to be getting slimmer by the outing. That catches oh. the edge and that'll be it for Cameron Bancroft. 
just waves at one outside the line of off stump. Healthy edge. Just eight runs today to go with a pair from his opening two innings. Mitch Marsh also struggling with the bat, making just nine. Dismissed after Sam Whiteman's 13. Wicketkeeper batter Josh Inglis steadying the ship with Cooper Connolly, surpassing a century from their fifth wicket partnership. In Melbourne, pies in the outer, but none from Scott Boland, dismissing one of the others in contention to pat up first in the opening test. Sam Constas makes only two at the MCG and welcome back Scott Boland. The man, 19-year-old Constas, is trying to replace atop the order, backing the teen sensation. Would have liked to have seen a bit more of him out here in the middle for sure, but what I have seen in the nets is he's got a lot of time, he's very organised. Smith happy to be back down the order ahead of summer, but finding someone else to open is proving tough. Marcus Harris also failing, gone for 16 in the second innings. We get something on that, and he's out! That has been brilliantly gloved by Josh Phillippe. Meantime, Scorchers captain Sophie Devine helping New Zealand to an historic T20 World Cup victory, defeating South Africa by 32 runs. Erin Harwood, Nine News. Well, when you think of Docklands, typically the AFL comes to mind, but that will change this Saturday. Docklands, the horse, not the stadium, is the UK import well on track to capture the Cox Plate. This five-year-old might well be racing's version of the Melways. His name is Docklands, based at Werribee and bound for Mooney Valley. But in truth, this Cox Plate hope is global, as is his trainer, who only flew in from London this morning. We went and saw, saw the horses this morning, so uh, we were delighted with how they looked. So, uh, as you said, now it's just about trying to stay awake as long as we can today. and trying to be fresh for the rest of the week. Harry Eustace is one of the biggest names in UK racing, continuing a long family tradition in the sport. And our spring carnival has always been a lure. To have one of our own that's good enough to come and hopefully compete at the top level in a race like the Cox Plate you know, means a, a huge amount. While Harry and Doc Lance will skip breakfast at the best at the Valley tomorrow, he still has plenty on his plate. Eustace has also brought out Sea King for next week's Geelong Cup with a view to running it in the Melbourne Cup. There's a bit of sort of ifs and buts with him at this stage. He needs to win to get in, but uh, he's certainly training very well. And Harry Coffey's Caulfield Cup win was celebrated far and wide, not least by his brother in Bali. <laughs> Sam was riding every step of the way with his brother, but the celebrations were put on hold momentarily to share in the excitement. You've got to ring me mum. You've got to ring me mum. Clint Stanaway, Nine News. Well, Ferrari has conquered the US with the Italian powerhouse claiming first and second at the Austin Grand Prix. But the race wasn't without controversy with reigning world champ Max Verstappen forcing close rival Lando Norris off the track at the first corner. I tried. He also went off the track. So if he goes off the track, clearly he's gone in way too hard and also gained an advantage by doing what he did. But I don't make the rules. Australian Oscar Piastri finished in fifth. And in the NFL, the San Francisco 49ers were out for revenge but couldn't flip the script on their Super Bowl rivals, Kansas City, losing the rematch 28-18. to Minnesota Vikings suffering its first loss of the season, losing a thriller to Detroit 31-29, to while the Steelers' decision to start veteran quarterback Russell Wilson paying off, taking down the Jets 37-15. to Tomo, good night of sport. Big night of sport. Yes. Tomorrow night we're checking with John Rilly, of course, the Wildcats coach. Interested to see what's going on with Bryce Cotton after yes. that incident on the weekend. Yeah, me too. And some serious tennis talent heading yeah, out Yeah, can't wait for that. Yeah, nor can I. Matthew, thank you. Where you can buy Perth's cheapest fuel, that is next. And uncovering the ways your personal information is being traded for profit and what you can do about it. Then sunny spring days on the horizon. Natalia, a beautiful week ahead. Yes, Tomo, a little cloudy tomorrow, but then it's bright blue skies for the rest of the week. Some warm temperatures as well. Your full forecast is coming up. When a data scientist started getting a lot of unwelcome phone calls, she decided to find out why and how. Her investigation took her deep into the little-known world of data brokers where personal data is legally sold for profit. As you're about to learn, our current privacy laws do little to stop them. 
Priya Dev has always gone to great lengths to protect her personal information from landing in the wrong hands. They're dark companies that go unnoticed. But not even a data science academic could hide from the hidden network of data broking. It's a dirty word, it's a dirty business. It's worth tens of billions of dollars all around the world. Despite being on the National Do Not Call Register, Priya started receiving dozens of unwanted calls from telemarketers and scammers and dug deeper. Tell us about this web. This is only a small view of the bigger web that exists. So it's even bigger than this. It's a lot bigger than this and it's global. Uncovering a sophisticated network of data broker companies buying and selling her information over 10 years without her knowledge. Some of the companies have legitimate clients, including banks, energy and car companies, and even the Australian Labor Party. It's passed through 50 hands or 100 hands, and that is the art of deception. It begs the question, do Australians really have any control over their personal information? Trading data for cash is a legal practice, but the problem is when it ends up in the wrong hands. Once you hand it over to someone, you don't know what they do with it. They might sell it. The federal government is working on upgrading our lagging 1988 privacy laws. In the first stage, proposing civil penalties for serious invasions of privacy. Those changes are currently before Parliament. Now working on a second stage, which will consider introducing clear mandatory consent so Australians can opt in or out of having their information shared. I think that we need to bring our privacy legislation into the digital age. At the moment, we clearly don't have enough regulation. We don't have enough control. Giving Australians power over their privacy. Claudia Radoljak, Nine News. The price of gold has shot to record highs as the war in the Middle East causes a spike in investor anxiety. Here's finance editor Chris Kohler. In times of uncertainty, people tend to invest in gold. And they must be really uncertain because the price of gold is at record highs, up 32% so far this year. The price has jumped above $2,700 US dollars an ounce for the first time as the war in the Middle East intensifies and the US presidential election gets closer. Bitcoin enthusiasts are also piling in. The cryptocurrency is trading at its highest level since June. And if you think all of that would mean investors would back off the share markets, you'd be wrong. It's also within reach of record highs. So money is flying in almost all directions directions on the markets. And of course, no surprise to see gold miners shooting higher today. Finally, the Australian dollar was mixed, buying 67 US cents today, just under 62 euro cents and 51 British pence. Let's take a look at the price of unleaded petrol across Perth tomorrow. The average will drop to $1.59.2 a litre, but you can find it cheaper on Marmion Avenue in Alcamos, on North Lake Road in South Lake, and on 2J Road in Stratton. A new survey is revealing the results of a mobile phone ban at schools in New South Wales. Since the ban a year ago, data from 1,000 principals oh, okay. wanna, shows student learning has improved by... 81%. They also say students are less distracted and socialising better at recess and at lunchtime. We want the remaining sceptics out there who are concerned about the policy to understand that it is working. Here in WA, rules are different. Primary school children aren't allowed to have phones with them, while high school students are allowed but must have it turned off and out of sight. Supercar drivers went a little off track this afternoon using the backdrop of the sea and the sand to rev their engines. Three vehicles going head-to-head -head with helicopters on main beach in the lead-up to the Gold Coast 500 racing starts on Friday. And it's heating up this week, Natalia, with all of your weather details coming up after this break. Welcome back. We had some decent falls in the 24 hours to 9 this morning. Bickley picking up 15 millimetres, but mostly sunny skies returned today. After a cool night, 10 the low, we had a reasonably cool October day with a top of 20. Right now in the city, it's 15.5, but feels cooler. To the charts and a weak cold front will brush past the southwest coast tomorrow. There's the slight risk of a shower here in Perth. A high will move into the bite and a trough will develop down the west coast later this week, so we will see some warmer temperatures. Across the nation, 
Education tomorrow, Brisbane partly cloudy in 28, mostly sunny in 23 in Sydney, a warm 30 in Melbourne, 24 the top in Adelaide with a slight chance of an evening shower. Back in the north of WA, some very hot weather, 42 the top at Kununurra and Marble Bar. Port Hedland and Newman will hit 37 and it'll be windy in Exmouth and Carnarvon. Further south, mostly sunny in Geraldton but cloudy in Durian Bay. Northern should hit 23 and Augusta and Albany could get a shower or two. On the waters, southwesterly winds 10 to 15 knots turning southerly in the evening, seas to a metre and swell to two and a half. Across the suburbs tomorrow, partly cloudy in Joondalup, Fremantle and Swanbourne, cloudy in Kalamunda and 20 the top in Mandra. So tomorrow will be a cloudy day in Perth. There's the slight chance of a shower in the morning and early afternoon, 21 after a low of 11. Looking ahead, nothing but sunshine and 24 on Wednesday, warming up to 27 degrees on Thursday. It'll be mostly sunny and 24 on Friday and Saturday. Bright blue skies and a top of 27 for Sunday. And take a look at next Monday. It'll be hot. 33 degrees is our forecast maximum. Nighttime temperatures ranging from 10 to 16. So plenty of sunshine to look forward to, Tomo. 33 is warming up. Natalia, thank you. That is nine news for this Monday, October 21. A current affair is next. Good night.